start recording. So good afternoon to everybody who is joining from Norway or other parts of Europe. And also good morning to those who might join from overseas from North or South America. So our fourth webinar in the Force Spectrum System and Geochemistry Network this year will be given by Nikolai Mosted and Brian Horsfield from GOS4. And the title is Controls of Bulk Petroleum Composition in Conventional and Unconventional Petroleum Systems. I think the main uh, presenter will be Nikolai, who studied applied geosciences and holds master's and PhD from Technical University of Berlin. Since 2013, he has been working as a petroleum system analyst at GOS4, service provider specializing in bulk petroleum composition and kinetic predictions in both conventional and unconventional place using kinetic modeling and PVT work. He's also been working as a guest scientist at the Organic Geochemistry Group at GFZ Potsdam, which was led by at least the geochemistry part by Brian Horsfield for many, many years. So we have uh, both of them here on the call, and then basically the webinar will be recorded and published later on. Uh, if all of you can have questions in the Teams chat written, and uh, please mute your microphone. And then at the end, when the presentation is over, there will be time for questions. So also welcome Nick, Clay, and Brian. And I also mute my microphone and the camera. So the floor is yours. You can share the presentation with the share button up in the uh, upper right. Mm -hmm. OK. It's good now. It's okay. So everybody sees that? Yeah, it should be good. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, hello everybody. Yeah, um, to this uh, webinar talk. Um, it's called "Controls of Bulk Petroleum Composition in Conventional and Unconventional Petroleum System." And initially, it was planned to. Uh, the title was planned to have "What We Have Learned from Unconventionals" <clears throat> with our work. And for that. Um, here's the outline of the talk uh, with the take home messages. I would like to first present some uh, why bike petroleum fluid prediction is a fundamentally important part of risk reduction, and then uh, present a recent successful case study using uh, Kelly from, uh, from the Northwest Shelf in Australia uh, using the phase kinetics, our working hose model that delivers sound predictions for conventional plays since 15 plus years. <clears throat> so then, a uh, first lesson we actually learned from unconventional is that this uh, phase kinetics approach does not work in unconventional systems. So a phase snapshots, phase envelope, envelope tuning approach has to be used to assess properties of fluids produced from unconventional, which are drastically fractionated with respect to predicted in situ fluids. So in the last part of the talk, I will show you also how FDICR is. Uh, Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spec, uh, highly sophisticated method can be used as a not magic screening tool to assess uh, different things like fractionation, extent during expulsion, migration, and production, maturity parameters, timing of oil expulsion from rock and API gravity, but also um, quantitative production allocation and oil source correlation. So it is FTIC RMS because that is what uh, our research actually focused on over the last years concerning unconventionals. But okay, let's start oops, uh, with the definition of petroleum. It is a collective term to mean any subsurface material that can be produced as oil or gas, including some associated non-hydrocarbons. Uh, chemically, it can be viewed as a continuum from very small compounds, uh, gaseous compounds like methane, to very large uh, compounds um, like asphaltines. Uh, looking closer, we see circular structures, aromatics, and linear structures, aliphatics, and the and the respective composition or um, proportion of those compounds in a in a petroleum fluid is actually the fluid composition. Easy. This is uh, classically viewed to uh, depend on, um, on kerogen type and actually also organophages. And on the thermal stress this uh, material experienced uh, during burial. Once the, the 
generated petroleum is uh, expelled from the source rock. The chemically, kinetically parameters are superseded by physical, con physical controls like um, pressure. So let's assume that a fluid uh, expelled at this point does not um, change its composition during migration up until uh, the pressure temperature condition where phase separation occurs. So at this point in this uh, PT space, we suddenly have two different phases with two totally different um, uh, physical properties so that uh, differential migration might occur. So the composition of uh, petroleum in an individual reservoir can is, is, is therefore basically a function of secondary physical and biological controls acting on the primary parameters, kerogen type and maturity, um, which uh, is controlled by the source and its position in the, in the basin. So end member, um, yeah, end member petroleum, end member examples of petroleum systems exist in this uh, ternary, in the space of this ternary diagram. And for instance, a very nice, uh, good example, nicely controlled by maturity is uh, the Sonda de Campeche, Mexico, uh, for offshore Mexico and the Southern Gulf of Mexico uh, that contains a series of fields um, vertically charged by the upper Jurassic um, source rock here shown in blue in this northeast southwest trending uh, profile. So we see a complex, complex structural setting, but not the wells and the, um, the, the noted source rock maturities, maturities which increase from 0.5 to 1.3% vitronit nit reflectors. So with the, um, so the overlying uh, the overlying acc accumulations they reflect this increase in maturity by strongly increasing GUR values. So um, yeah, the composition in oil and gas fields uh, in the in the Viking Graben Norway is strongly controlled by secondary parameters. Um, and uh, the compositions are a result of phase separation. So the fields here plot nicely plot along the bubble point and dew point and the calculated bubble and dew point curves in this uh, GUR saturation pressure diagram and whereby the lines converge uh, close to the composition of the Waller field. So the Waller and Lillefrick are undersaturated uh, yeah, under with respect to the reservoir pressure and can therefore be um, assumed to contain the, the initial petroleum fluid prior to uh, phase separation taking place during upwards migration. Okay, those um, bubble point and uh, dew point curves um, are actually characteristic features of a given of an individual petroleum system and um, which is shown here in this plot, uh, uh, saturation pressure versus gas liquid ratio plots for fluids from different from diverse petroleum systems, and one can see directly that gas liquid ratios, or, or therefore given gas liquid ratios, saturation pressure can um, differ uh, by, uh, that is equivalent, equivalent to a range in depth of two kilometers. So the question arises, why uh, do we see so different uh, saturation pressures? And can we predict that? And um, clearly, First answer, saturation pressures are defined by the chemical composition. This can be shown in the same plot, but no overlain, overlined with the API gravity. And we see here directly that higher API gravities um, have lower saturation pressures for any given uh, gas liquid ratio, which uh, reflects basically an, uh, the better solubility of the light liquid in the on the dew point curve side, at least of the light liquid in the in the gas phase, as shown here by this uh, this uh, condensate sample compared to the heavy waxy condensate sample. So saturation pressures are much higher here. Uh, on the dew point uh, side, saturation pressures are mainly controlled by liquids composition, whereas on the bubble point uh, curves, 
uh, side uh, by the composition of the gas. So drier composition makes higher saturation pressures and methane is not as good soluble in the, in the liquids than, wet, than the wetter gas. So the, the answer to the question is yet, yes, so the chemical differences are controlled by kerogen, the macromolecular precursor of petroleum. And we, the key to predict those petroleum physical properties is actually, so prior to drilling, is actually to determine the bulk composition of the petroleum that is first formed in the source rock as a function of maturity. And best using um, individual source rocks from the from the petroleum system under study. So we do that um, since years using a forward modeling um, approach called phase kinetics, as I pointed out. Um, that is basically that basically compares hydrocarbon compositions in laboratory fluids to those in natural fluids. So uh, it utilizes immature samples and um, a combination of closed and open system pyrolysis methods to predict petroleum type, organophages, thermal response or the biokinetics, and uh, the evolving composition as a function of maturity. Uh, the gathered data can then be uh, tuned into a PVT predictive format, and we can use it to yeah, predict uh, physical properties like GOR, saturation pressure, or API, or formation volume factors. Um, so that uh, so this, there are many published examples for phase kinetics as it uh, works very nicely in conventional systems. Um, and I would like to run you through this approach uh, by using um, an example from the Bidu sub basin of the Northwest Shelf Australia, where large uh, oil discoveries, discoveries were made in, in the last few years. So the biggest one, oops, the biggest one being the Dorado oil field uh, here. So we analyzed the um, putative source rock, which is the Kelly formation and HIs, hydrogen index values plot uh, between 500 and 200 milligram per gram TUC, uh, which uh, qualifies the source rock as a type two, three source rock. Now, the first step of the, in, in the phase kinetics approach is to define the petroleum type organophages by using uh, open system pyrolysis GC FID pyrolysates or more, um, uh, more specifically the, the chainings distribution in this uh, ternary diagram. So here waxy hydrocarbons are plotted versus intermediate uh, chain links hydrocarbons versus total gas. And the Kelly formation plots uh, somewhere over a broader range uh, here at the border of the of the mixed base paraffinic to paraffinic uh, high wax to high wax to low wax oils. So this large variability in composition is mainly due to the to a strong yeah to the to a variable mixture of uh, chemical well, the, to, to the precursor structures from the biota uh, sedimented in this mixed fluvial lacustrine lagoonal environment, which. It's rich in subarinite. <clears throat> okay, the second st uh, step consists in defining the, the thermal response of the of the of the source rocks by using a bulk open system pyrolysis, and uh, the stability of the different chemical bonds you know, can be described by kinetic parameters. So we usually use a discrete distribution of activation energies and an, a single frequency factor. So one important message here is don't use default kinetics because the kinetic variability is not only big between different kerogen types, but as can be seen here also for one source rock type in a, in a petroleum system. So here taking the transformation ratios with the temperature curves, you can see nicely for the Kelly formation source rock that onset of uh, petroleum formation here at roughly 10% transformation ratio can differ by up to 25 degrees, which is uh, yeah, which translates to almost one kilometer of burial in the in the system. So now to get um, to get the compositional data in our compositional kinetic models, 
we run MSSV pyrolysis uh, to different transformation to five uh, transformation ratio uh, ratios uh, defined by the open system bulk uh, kinetic. And once the data, data is uh, gathered, it's tuned into, into a PVT compatible format and uh, kinetic models can be built by populating the open system data by this closed system data. Here, I would uh, like to quickly point out how we, um, yeah, how the MSV data has to be tuned to make it uh, PVT predictive. Uh, here it's shown the minimum PVT composition <clears throat> that is readily available from MSV pyrolysis. So the individual gas compound amounts and the C7 plus fraction. So tuning, the only two tuning steps needed now are simply the adjustment of gas composition as laboratory gases are always uh, too wet and the subdivision of the C7 plus fraction into six pseudo compounds ranging up to C80 as uh, a resolution of up to C80 to 100 is needed by the equation of state to be yeah, phase behavior predictive. So our laboratory data or yeah this is only has a resolution up to c30 only so again then we can build the kinetic models here shown for the Kelly formation source rocks which can be also directly imported into let's say petromod uh, data as geofiles um okay before showing the, pre uh, the, the predictive prediction results for the Kelly formation i would like to here also to point out quickly that you should you don't use default GR, GR kinetics um, what you see here and this um, is, is uh, phase kinetic GOR predictions uh, from a large series of marine source rocks and um, which can be described as A and B type source rocks uh, following Pepper and Corby scheme. Now, what you see here is that none of those uh, source rocks actually fall into the A and B uh, generation schemes uh, areas uh, of, of, yeah, of, of the default kinetics. So the meaning at um, so the, the kinetics, so depths of generation is pretty pretty okay. But the GUR is much higher for at, at already lower maturities. So, yeah, so much, so much uh, gas richer petroleum can be generated much earlier than would be than would be modeled using the default kinetics. So, coming now to the fluid compositions uh, to the Dorado fluids, we can see that using the Kelly formation. Uh, predictions the fluid compositions are predicted correctly. So the Dorado, Dorado fluids uh, plot here, uh, the black oils, the volatile oils uh, undersaturated mostly and uh, with rather high saturation pressures. And uh, for the phase kinetic prediction at 90% transformation ratio, cumulative yields uh, um, yeah, cover low gas liquid ratios nicely whereas instantaneous yields uh, cover the high liquid gas uh, gas liquid ratios nicely. Oops. So in here again, so the Kelly formation qualifies as a DE high hydrogen index uh, source rocks source rock. And again here, using the default kinetic, we would never. Oh, it, it was very unlikely that we would have uh, predicted the especially the low li gas liquid ratio fluids correctly using the default kinetics. Okay, so now um, I would like to uh, come to the point where we use, uh, we try PVT prediction and unconventionals. And as I pointed out in the beginning, um, phase kinetics does not work for unconventionals as all the predicted or all the actually produced fluids uh, exhibit much higher GOR values, uh, GORs, than the predicted in situ fluids. This is mainly related to, um, yeah, to, to production fractionation and the preferential um, production of low mo lower molecular weight hydrocarbons and resins. Um, one way to work around that, uh, or an initial idea to work around that is to use to use mature samples 
uh, a little bit less mature than um, samples in the in the target well where PDT data is um, available and heat those samples by uh, single phase snapshots to the desired mature uh, to the desired um, yeah transformation ratio or maturity of the target well um, of the target well yeah okay doing that uh, we have also a, we yeah we published a few examples uh, using phase snapshots uh, for PVT production uh, prediction in unconventional systems but uh, as this is a rather young topic for us uh, we are still writing up other other study areas um, what I can already say those phase snapshots still have to be tuned as uh, and I want to demonstrate that here using the Wacker Muerta formation in the Newton Basin Argentina clearly one of the world's largest unconventional shale oil and gas resources so they have to be tuned because um, still the uh, still there's a fractionation effect upon production making the the produced fluids much uh, um, have gas richer so what is shown here are um, in, in blue snapshots phase envelopes of uh, snapshots at 50 60 and 70 percent transformation ratio and all of those are no good match uh, to the to the produced flu fluid shown here in pink <clears throat> as i say due to uh, production fractionation um, so we de developed a two step uh, phase envelope tuning approach um, with which we can actually assess the liquid retention taking place uh, to to explain the, the produced fluid compositions. So the first step consists in um, simply lowering, lowering the molecular weight of the C7 plus fraction of the best fitting snapshot of fluid here, the 50% transformation fluid to that, in the, to that in the produced oil. So that gives us a, a a first tuned phase envelope here in light blue, which already fits a little bit better. In the second tuning step, we actually take care of how much liquids are really re retained during production, thereby, thereby um, increasing the GOR, which governs, um, yeah, which governs the envelope heights here. So we see here that at 37% a liquid retention, we, we have a perfect fit to the produced fluid. So 30% is too low, but 37% fits perfectly. And so do the other physical properties shown here in this uh, table. So 40, almost 40% 40 liquid retention uh, seems uh, to be pretty excessive, but uh, this has not to be the case for every unconventional resource play, as is shown here, an example from the Midland Basin. So here, the snapshot fluid in blue already uh, fits pretty good. The target well shown here in, in yellow, but the quick condenser still exceeds uh, that of the produced fluid. So by lowering in the first tuning step now, the molecular weight of the C7 plus fraction again from 249 to that of the produced fluid, which is 222, we get a nicer fitting phase envelope at this position. And then in the second tuning step, 20% liquid retention is found, is found to really account for the produced fluid compositions. Shown here, so the dark uh, blue phase envelope fits the yellow phase envelope. So and now comes the question, yeah, why, why do we have such uh, different uh, liquid retentions, uh, extents of liquid retention? And one major control that we found is that maturity uh, is, is a major control on liquid retention. So it exceeds, so it increases strongly from a roughly 20 at uh, between reflectance around um, 0.8 or 0.7 up to almost 70%. So this was based on a study uh, where, where, fate, where homogeneous source rock uh, well, play uh, from which black oils to condensates were produced. So it is not a collection of different petroleum systems. 
Um, yeah, so, so 70% liquid retention is really excessive. And uh, so one should think about uh, changing a little bit the production strategies to get at least out a little bit of the liquids that are left behind here. Okay, now I would like to come to the third topic, which is the importance of NSO compounds on uh, uh, physical properties in unconventional plays. So the so clearly um, <clears throat> retained petroleum fluids are strongly enriched in NSO compounds um, compared to the conventional oils, which is shown here. So this. Uh, Prefer preferential, okay, mainly due to fraction, um, expulsion fractionation during um, you know, preferential retention of NSO compounds uh, during expulsion. So this uh, preferential retention is uh, mainly explainable because the polar NSO compounds um, feature functional groups uh, which have a high affinity to sorb to the to the organic matter itself or to the source rock matrix. So as those retained fluids are much more enriched in NSO compounds, they uh, show higher viscosity, uh, polar NSO compounds, they show higher viscosities and densities, which clearly has a big impact on producibility. So my take home message here is, th is that not only the, the bicomposition of uh, expelled and retained fluids is different, but also the NSO composition. And this I would like to point out in the, uh, so this was um, studied using the, um, using FT ICR as, as a screening tool for those NSO compounds in the last few years um, yeah, at GFZ. The, this machine stand is at GFZ. So different, um, electro, uh, different, different ionization methods can be used for this, um, uh, for this, tool and uh, whereas uh, electrospray ionization uh, covers the broadest range in uh, molecular weight um, and is therefore best qualified um, to analyze big uh, compounds, uh, big and polar compounds like uh, asphaltines and resins. So as uh, uh, a lot of in the, the mass specs really, really a lot of uh, signals and compounds uh, are detected, uh, we have to break down this large information using uh, certain uh, proxies, um, which is visualized in this uh, pie chart. So the first most important, not most important, but the first proxy used is, uh, we always uh, use is the elemental class distribution shown here on the inner circle, which is just a relative distribution of compounds containing only oxygen, or containing oxygen uh, heteroatoms versus compounds that contain nitrogen heteroatoms versus compounds that contain nitrogen and oxygen hetero compounds versus uh, compounds that contain only sulfur heteroatoms. So the outer circle is uh, the second proxy is the compound classes distribution within a single elemental class. So here, for example, the, um, the percentage of one oxygen containing compounds on, on, the comp on all only oxygen containing compounds. So diving deeper into this, uh, into this data, we can also um, <clears throat> um, yeah, plot relative intensities within a certain compound class and done here using the DBE versus carbon number plot of the only one nitrogen containing compounds. And carbon number here stands for, for the amount of carbon in a molecule and DBE stands for uh, the yeah, double bond equivalent, which means uh, unsaturation in rings. And higher numbers uh, correlate to higher aromaticity or larger aromatic core structures. <clears throat> so, okay, PVT prediction. So, there are many published examples using FT ICRMS over the last uh, over the last few years, but uh, it was not done actually only for PVT prediction, but rather to uh, assess fractionation effects uh, on the petroleum composition from source to sink to production facility. Um, yeah, and um, 
I can, I can really not uh, go in too much detail here on, to every study, but I would like to uh, just present a few core work and uh, cool applications that came out of this research. So the first one is the Posidonia shale source extracts versus um, uh, crude oils. And using this elemental class distribution in the pie charts, uh, it is clear that um, the ele elemental composition of the NSO fraction really uh, is different with increasing maturity. But at all stages, uh, crude oils, uh, uh, source rock extracts, or the retained petroleum is is um, is rich in oxygen, nitrogen, and oxygen and nitrogen containing compounds. In contrast, the crude oils uh, that were roughly expelled at 0.7 percent between nitrate reflectance are all only dominated by only oxygen and only nitrogen containing compounds. So. Clearly, there was a strong fractionation during production with a preferential retention of compounds with more heteroatoms. So those have a greater intermolecular interactions with the source rock, with the source rock uh, material. Um, now, those fractionation uh, effects can also assess diving deeper into the into the only one nitrogen containing compounds. Um, and I want to, and here on the left hand side, we see a, we see a turned diagram which features compounds from the carbazole family with increasing DBE numbers or increasing aromatic core sizes. And one can see, and we can see directly that the oils here, the circles, plot in totally different position than the extracts, which in, evolve with maturity up to the corner of the highest uh, aromaticity. And this is clearly a sign for production fractionation with an enrichment of smaller aromatic core structures in the oils and enrichment of larger aromatic core structures in the extracts. So the, the single oils uh, are resemble each uh, are similar to each other and evolve with maturity in this rectangle. So those rectangles for oils and extracts can also be used to assess uh, the maturity of oils and extracts. So to all those uh, aromatic compounds, um, aliphatic carbon is attached. And on the right-hand side, diagram, ternary diagram, the DBE9 carbazole compounds are features to which uh, short uh, chains are attached versus intermediate chains versus long chains. And again, the oils pot, plot in a different position than the extracts and show higher uh, aliphaticities. The, <clears throat> the extracts have low aliphaticities at low maturity levels, and which then decrease up to roughly 0.7 percent between nitro flattens, and then decrease again, probably mainly due at this position due to the expulsion of uh, of uh, the oils. And with the oils, uh, yeah. At 0.7 percent between nitro flagging, the, the, those alkylated carbon uh, carbazole structures were expelled with the oils. And so, using this ternary diagram, we uh, can assess the oil expulsion timing from source rocks. Okay, let's come now to the second example, uh, which which is from the Niobara Formation in the Denver Basin. Uh, which we use here to show that not only during production there's a large fractionation effect, but also during um, expulsion. Um, during expulsion from the source rock units to the reservoir units uh, in unconventional systems. So for the in the Niagara uh, play, the mal horizons um, are the source rock uh, are the source. Uh, with uh, NSO contents around 30, and the chalk units can be described as the reservoir or reservoirs or sweet spots with NSO contents around uh, 20%. So the SARA composition of the oils, uh, of the produced oils from the chalks, uh, is pretty similar to the chalk units. Now, what we see within this NSO fraction is that there is fractionation going on uh, in the same direction. Um, 
oh, for both expulsion and production, meaning that nitrogen and oxygen compounds go up or increase, and hetero compounds with more than two hetero atoms go down. So what we also see is that the fractionation impact is bigger for production here than for expulsion. And now that this fractionation impact is big on ar aromaticity is uh, also seen in this, uh, uh, in this previously discussed uh, ternary featuring the, the aromatic core size distribution. And the extracts show here a big range due to maturity and migration fractionation. Looking here into the mal source rock units, the diamonds, they appear to be a little bit more mature than the squares, so the chalk units, the reservoir units, which shift towards the oil positions, the produced oil positions. So clearly what we see is a prefer preferential expulsion and production of compounds with smaller aromatic core structures. But again, the fractionation effect is bigger during production than during expulsion. That fractionation impact on aliphaticity is much smaller and can be seen here in, the, in this Turner diagram featuring the, the car, aliphatic carbon number distribution. And we see directly that X, well, not all fluids more or less uh, plot in the same field. Only the oils are perhaps shifted a little bit uh, to, the, to higher aliphaticities. So we can assume that uh, production, yeah, a small production fractionation effect uh, with the preferential production of compounds with higher aliphatic carbon numbers. So using the data, the same data, but for the, for the to vaca muerta formation for oils and uh, extracts from the vaca muerta formation, I want to uh, demonstrate that this uh, same data can also be used for production allocation in unconventional settings. Meaning that, um, yeah, the composition um, of, of the, the composition of the extracts should be closest to that of the produced oils when yeah, production occurred from this interval. We know for the, for the vaca muerta formation, in this case, that production occurred from the upper vaca muerta. And we see nicely here that the oils plot closer to the upper vaca muerta uh, extracts than the lower vaca muerta extracts, which, is, uh, which are much more mature, or a little bit more mature, let's say. Um, again, the same data can also be used to successfully predict uh, API gravities. So for that, we uh, adopted a model, um, an approach from uh, published by Total Stuff 2015, who used heavy over medium cut ratios um, of size exclusion chromatography of oils and extracts uh, to correlate those versus API. So we assumed that the sum of short and intermediate uh, aliphatic carbon numbers is a medium cut and uh, the long aliphatic carbon numbers is a heavy cut and uh, calculated API gravities uh, between yeah, 38 and 40 for the oils, uh, which is very close actually to the for API of 41, to the reported API of 41. For the for the upper vaca muerta, we have a perfect fit with 41, and whereas the lower vaca muerta is, uh, shows higher APIs with 44, which is again in line with the higher maturity and production from the uh, upper vaca muerta. Okay, now then let's come to a, a last highlight. Um, we developed also a, a method with which we can um, chemostatistically allocate uh, produced oil volumes to individual reservoirs using all assigned formulas in the mass spectra of yeah, all uh, investigated samples. So strongly fractionated and mixed oils can be uh, unmixed using um, yeah, unmixed and allocated to the, to the different bitumens representing uh, different reservoirs in the unconventional play. So the <clears throat> so the so the actually actual mathematical correlation is uh, relationships is that the 
the proportion beta one in a, in, of a given compound in the oil um, is the sum of uh, the proportion of all bitumens yeah, to that compound. And for, for bitumens, uh, and for bitumens, it's the proportion of, uh, so for bitumens is the, the contribution, so the production contribution to the oil is the sum of all uh, pro of all contributions of the single compounds. Okay, that is a little bit complicated. And um, so uh, to say it easily, production allocation is the, it's a process of uh, determining the values of the many betas here in this uh, matrix. So to, to, um, to really uh, calculate this algorithm, we um, developed a deconvolution software which utilizes the fully implicit finite difference iteration uh, scheme. And then the first step simply consists of input of data, all the data of the target oil and the candidates. Bitum, candidate bitumens. The second step is just running the program, which uh, takes roughly 10 minutes, also uh, yeah, depending on the sample number numbers used. And here for the Naya, the outcome for the Niobrara play is uh, that uh, most of the oil was actually you know, can be allocated to be produced on the A chalk and B chalk units. Yeah. Um, which really nicely fits previous uh, observation based on biomarkers. For the Vaca Muerta formation, 80% um, uh, contribution can be assigned to the upper Vaca Muerta and 15 or lower to the uh, lower Vaca Muerta formation, which is at least uh, going in the right direction. Uh, also taking into account that only two samples uh, were used for this uh, for this um, allocation. So we wanted to test this model also for, or we wanted to test if we can use this model for unmixing conventional oils and prepared uh, five mixtures of a lacustrine and a an, uh, marine oil uh, at, uh, and, yeah, at similar volumes of 100 milliliter. So the final outcome is, uh, that calculated contributions of the lacustrine source rocks source rock uh, are really yeah fit really nicely the the true weight percentage of the source rock or NSO compounds of the source rock in the in the physical mixture with a nice R square. So oil source correlation we can say that oil source correlation is quantitative oil source correlation is possible if uh, we know the if we know the end member oils, um, yeah, which is a really cool feature and should be tested uh, in, of course, in other, in other areas. So, okay, that's almost it. Just, uh, I don't want to uh, sum up everything again. So here's my take home message and little infomercial um, saying that uh, face kinetics delivers sound bite petroleum fluid predictions in a broad variety of petroleum provinces and you can directly import the output into petromap software using geofiles and you only have to uh, uh, send us potential source rock reservoir cores or oils and we what we do as gs4 uh, we have a rapid response discounted prices and we think molecular and um, provide you with a nice uh, phase kinetics um, model and if you have a place that uh, go more into the direction of an unconventional place, we can also uh, use uh, other, yeah, other approaches like the face snap snapshot approach or FDICR as for a more fully integrated analytical approach with quick insights in, on fractionation, expulsion timing, etc. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much. Very good overview. Uh, I could see in the chat uh, that uh, no questions have been put in yet. If anybody from the audience is willing, either you can put in your questions in the chat or you can just raise your hand and you can speak up if you want to. Uh, 
very good presentation. Thank you. And very good uh, published examples with the references encoded. So people can go into the references later on. So anybody with any question on this interesting topic? Was a nope. little bit too too much overkill. No, I, I have one on this. So you show this uh, retention of liquids. Is, um, so maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but basically it means that if you have uh, it was going from 20% to 70%. So if your source rock is reaching like within like 1.3, it is retaining. 70% of the liquids which are produced at that level. I mean, a lot of them is already produced. I don't know, maybe I'm misinterpreting that. How How is that working or how is that? No, just, it just means if you have a, if you have a, a play, I mean, it, this is um, source rock plays, right? Unconventional yeah. plays. So if you produce from the source rock play at, which is at 1.3% with your nitro flattens, then you're right, they're not, Likely there are not many liquids in this play anyways, perhaps very he heavy liquids, but what you produce is anyways a gas condensate or condensate, but still you're leaving a lot of the liquids which might be in this play um, under in the subsurface. So you I don't see. Produce so basically it's a production, liquids. production related issue that if yeah. you have a source of like the Bakken or I'm not sure maybe not, but uh, the Eagle Ford going from like 0 0.6 to like 2, then if you are, have a well producing from Vitinite 1, you, of course, most of the products or some of it has been expired and migrated out and left, but yeah, what is remaining in the system due, due to the production issue, that yeah. it will be left about 40%, but if you are doing a well in a more mature section, Vitinite 1.3, then it's you are not able to produce out more than thirty percent of the liquids. So that that I understand. Okay, so I, I got of that. the liquids of the liquids in the produced petroleum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I guess I, it's I'm not like... I'm not talking about the complete assist uh, um, of the of assessed uh, liquid. Yeah, I see. I see. Only, I only at this of... point. In... Yeah, it's a lot of economic implications of oil price versus gas price, and of course it's changing through time. So. Do do you have any like uh, answer of how the operators are trying to optimize? I mean, it's very complicated. The oil price, gas price, changing very much now. The gas price is like ten times higher than the oil price, or five times. But yeah. maybe like two years ago, it was the opposite. And uh, is there any best practice what the operators do with the val uh, completions? And I think I think we are not at this stage yet as uh, as a company. We as Geosphere because we because we for because we really do not uh, engineer those uh, uh, plays. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. it's just we are in, in an academic phase, let's say. We, but of okay. course, uh, I mean there there should be a way to enhance the recovery of the liquids in the in the play. Okay, all right. Thank using you. Using different uh, agents. Could I, could, could I just yeah? Could I just say something? At that yeah, of course. Point. Yeah. What Nick has shown are the uh, results of a very recent study, where we we're actually for the first time working with the petroleum engineers to see if we can bring together our predictions versus what they believe is in the in the shales, and uh, I think as you can well imagine. Uh, a lot of the petroleum engineers are rather suspicious anyway of the kind of data that we're generating and what geochemists do. And so what we're trying to do is not only uh, improve our methods, we're also trying to bridge a huge discipline gap. You know, mentality of engineers and geoscientists is so different, as we all know. And so Nick and I have been working very closely, luckily with a geologist who has got a really good uh, colleagues within this major company. So it's early days, but it's going quite well, I think. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, thank you. So anybody from the audience, now it's your chance to raise your hand and ask uh, nice detailed questions or uh, things <laughs> that you want to know more about. 
otherwise we will close it. We don't have to now uh, one question from Ali Reza. So I mute myself. You can just uh, introduce yourself, uh, which company work, and then just you ask. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hello, uh, hey. I'm uh, working at Evitiha Aachen University, and uh, my first thank you for a uh, nice uh, uh, presentation. And uh, my question is uh, regard to the last part about the deconvolution of oil. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe I missed the part, but do we need an end member of the each uh, um, oil that contribute in mixing? Uh, in the moment for them to test the method, we use that, of course, but uh, you can, I mean, perhaps they're in between end members. I mean, just the, the member farthest to the end, you know, you should perhaps take it and then another end member or almost end member, and then you can unmix those, of course. You can try to do that. But um, you at least, if, if you produce an oil and you want to know if it's an or you're sure that it's, let's say, or you're sure it must be, there must be a lacustrine source and there must be a marine source, then you should, and you, you think you know the source, and then you could at least try to uh, uh, use oils which are cleaner and not as mixed as uh, those you find during your production. So you can definitely yeah, try also. Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, I guess that it will also. Yeah. No, it's okay. you, you know, because the problem is that right now I'm dealing with a lot of oil samples that I know that it's a mixture, mm -hmm. uh, but I do not have any access to the end member. But um, but perhaps you have analogs kind of. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you much. Now Bastian is writing in a chat, so maybe that's a question we can read up or you can even say it to you, Bastian. You are in the office about 50 meters from me, I know. <laughs> OK, no, he just said yes to leave. OK, sorry. So basically, if nobody else has a question, then this is the last chance. Then if not, then we can close the nice webinar and stop the recording.